We are Dave Zebos, and it's already Thursday, and it's a beautiful day in Minnesota. I'm very excited about today's guest speaker. I know her well. In fact, uh, John LaRock's with me this morning, and he knows her well because she's on staff at River of Life. And her name is Christina, and she's amazing. <laughs> and so, Christina, why don't you come over here and share what's on your heart? All right. Good morning, everyone. Like Dave said, my name is Christina. If you don't know me, I am the Children's Ministries Leader here at River of Life. Been here for two years tomorrow, and so I'm very excited to be here sharing with you guys this morning. Um, and I'm going to read, otherwise I could go for way too long, so I'm going to try to keep it under 10 minutes, maybe. Um, so I'm going to read for you guys. But when Dave asked me to do the Devo for today, I asked him what I should talk about, what he wanted me to talk about. And he said, whatever God has been putting on your heart. And so a few ideas came to mind immediately, um, but I didn't know for sure until yesterday what I was going to talk about. But God confirmed that this was what we should talk about this morning. So that said, we are going to talk about God and his character, specifically as he reveals it in his name. And throughout the Bible, and even today, people give names to God based on his action in their life. And for the sake of time, I'll just give you two examples. The first one in Genesis 16, when Hagar is in the wilderness after being mistreated by Sarah, and God sees her and responds to her grief and need, and she calls his name the God who sees me. And a modern example would be the song Waymaker, which attributes that name to God, and that title to God. So in the passage that I want to look at with you guys this morning, we don't find any human giving a name to God, but we find God revealing his own name. And so the setting here is that Moses has gone back up Mount Sinai to receive the second set of tablets of the Ten Commandments. And he had destroyed the first set um, when he came down the mountain to see the people in rebellion against God and worshiping the golden calf. On the mountain, God had requested to see God. Moses had requested to see God's glory, and God reminded him that no one could see God's glory and live. But he promised to make his goodness pass before Moses. And that sets the stage for the verses that we're going to look at, and they are God revealing himself to Moses. So Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, God declares his name, and this is what he says. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And in response, Moses bowed down and worshiped. So if you don't listen to anything else that I say this morning and stop watching this video now, please, please, please still take time to meditate on those two verses because they are absolutely crazy. It's crazy that God reveals himself in this way. He speaks his name to Moses and what this name tells us about God is absolutely crazy. This name of God is referenced throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, and it comes up over and over and over again. This is what the people held on to, what they knew to be true about God, because he revealed himself. And in the biblical context, names reveal character and truth. And obviously there's a lot in this name. But, God, but if God does not change, and we believe he doesn't, then the self-revelation of God is super important to us today, too. So we're going to look at both parts, two parts of this name. The first part talks about God being slow to anger and being merciful and forgiving. And we tend to be more familiar and comfortable with this concept, but that doesn't lessen it in any way. We're comfortable and familiar with it because it is so deeply important. The very fact that I got up this morning and that you got up this morning are incredible acts of God's mercy. We are less comfortable, though, with God's mercy when he gives it to those that we think should be struck down by lightning where they stand. And yesterday, a dear friend pointed out to me that the fact that God's judgment is often slower to come than we would like to see points to the character of God. He is slow to anger. Not that he doesn't get angry, 
but he is slow to anger. And the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 reminds us, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God desires for us to repent and return to right relationship with him. And he is patient, forgiving, and slow to anger. So please take time today to praise God for his mercy in your life, for everything he has accomplished, and consider the mercy that you are called to have on others. The second part of God's revelation here is something that we're less comfortable with. It's the fact that he does not let the guilty go unpunished. On the one hand, we are comfortable with this because we know that when people wrong us, justice will be served by God. However, we're less comfortable with it when we realize that we are all guilty. So as you praise God today for his mercy, please also pause and consider what you need to confess. God's mercy and judgment go hand in hand, and we can't understand one without the other. We are guilty. No one is righteous. No, not one. And there's often, if not always, more that we need to confess than we are even aware of. And what's been helpful for me are the words from a prayer in the Book of Common Prayer. The prayer of confession there, we ask forgiveness with these words. We ask forgiveness for the things that we have done and the things that we have left undone. I am so incredibly thankful for both of these truths about God. We would have no hope in life if it weren't for both of these truths. We live and move and have our being in God because of his mercy. And we have a chance to live and interact in our world and our community and our churches and our families because of his grace. On the other hand, when things are wrong in the world, as they always are, and is especially amplified in times like these, we can be assured that God does not let the guilty go unpunished. He is a God of justice. God's mercy and God's justice are so fully seen in Jesus Christ. God knew that we could never live perfect lives because of the sin in our hearts. Yet because of God's mercy, he did not destroy us, but instead he sent his son Jesus to take the place of you and of me. Jesus died on the cross to fulfill the wrath of God, and he extends God's mercy to us. When we trust in Jesus for forgiveness and accept this gift of God, we are assured that we will not have to bear the final and full punishment for our sins because Jesus already paid that price. Mm. This doesn't mean that there won't be consequences and judgments for our actions in this life, but we are freed from the ultimate death that we deserve. I want to close this morning by recognizing that we do see injustices happening at every turn in our world and in our country and in our state, particularly this week, the killing of George Floyd. We live in a broken world, and that there's absolutely no question about that. Yet, we have hope because of who God is. God promises to make all things new, and we long for that day when he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. We know that God will bring ultimate justice, no matter what happens in this world. But rather than letting us off the hook, this should make us jump to action. We are called to be merciful as God is merciful, and we are called to seek justice because God is a God of justice. God deeply cares for all people, and his heart for the oppressed is so clear in scripture and in his character. So I want to ask you today, how can you be merciful and seek justice? What does this look like in your life and in your sphere of influence? My prayer today is that we would be people of both mercy and justice because we serve a God of mercy and justice. Let's pray. God, you are far beyond our comprehension. We praise you for your mercy and your judgment. Please empower us with your spirit to fight for justice and extend mercy to those around us that all might see who you are and that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So that was really, really good. And I just want to apologize to you and Christina because someone just made me aware that I forgot to activate the camera on top. 
It's been coming from the bottom where I'm looking now, and so that's totally my bad. So we're going to have her back soon to do it again. Of course, you want to listen to this and spread the good news. Excellent word there, Christina. You all have a great day. Remember, we're fighting how? From victory or for victory? We are fighting from victory. you got to have this down. No, not for victory. Have a great day in Jesus Christ. Catch you later.